Uh, hi everyone, my name is Colin Howlett. I'm a, as Tamara said, I'm a postdoc at the University of Queensland. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, some work we've been doing on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Peculiar Velocity Catalog. And so if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk is that we're providing uh, and producing a new catalog of peculiar velocities, which is a sample of over 30,000 measurements using the fundamental plane. It covers about 7,000 square degrees and it goes all the way up to a of 0.1. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to first start off with why should we care? And by we, I mean you, I mean, obviously I care. Um, what the data characteristics are, um, what we've done to basically improve the fitting methodology and uh, have a look at some of the things like systematics and actually enable us to fit uh, a lot, such a large data set. Uh, and then some quick forecasts of what we want to do in the future with this data set and some future plans. So first things first, uh, pure velocity surveys. So um, pure velocities are basically the um, motions of galaxies in departure from the standard Hubble flow. Uh, and they can be inferred from empirical distances. Uh, so that's anything which acts as a standard candle or standard ruler and an observed redshift. Basically, when I say peculiar velocities, uh, what I'm talking about is if you look at this hopefully very well-known equation for redshifts, uh, on the left-hand side, you have a measured redshift. On the right-hand side, you might have a cosmological redshift. Uh, and then the bit in the middle is the peculiar velocity. And so the interesting thing about peculiar velocities is that they are direct measurements of the dark and baronic, uh, plus baronic matter field. Um, they're independent of things like galaxy bias and in fact uh, independent of basically any of the ways that galaxies don't perfectly trace dark matter uh, and they can be combined with redshift surveys in the local universe to overcome things like cosmic variance so to get away from the fact that we only have a finite uh, patch of the universe in which to look uh, around us um, what i'm showing on the right here is an example of the fundamental plane of galaxies which is one of these methods we can use to get empirical distances to objects uh, another very, very well-known one is, of course, type 1a supernovae, which give you a uh, distance measurement. Um, and the fundamental plane I'm showing here, I'm showing because this is what we use in the SDSS pure velocity catalog. And this is a relationship between the surface brightness of a galaxy, which is, if I can try and find how to uh, see this. Let's have a look. Um, uh, which is uh, basically the i-axis here, um, and then you have velocity dispersion on the vertical axis, and then on the um, axis along the bottom here, you have the effective size of the galaxy, and departures or in, uh, from the Hubble flow or pure velocities effectively manifest themselves as uh, displacements along the r direction here in the fundamental plane. So why do we care? Um, so things we can use pure velocity surveys for are things like transient uh, corrections. So for instance, when we make Hubble diagrams using either supernovae or gravitational waves, uh, it turns out that peculiar velocities uh, add a very large uh, source of statistical and um, potential systematic error. And so the plot I'm showing here is just taken from a paper I had uh, with Tamara uh, last year on show showing that the peculiar velocity for the binary neutron star merger was uh, a very important statistical and systematic effect for the Hubble parameter you obtained from that data. You can also use them to produce really cool maps of our local universe, uh, as was done in this paper. So this is a reconstruction of the density in our local universe using pure velocities. And you can also use them for cosmological measurements. And so in this plot, I'm showing uh, a list of uh, measurements of what we call the growth rate of structure. So this is basically how fast structures are growing in the local universe as a function of redshift. And this has very strong predictions from general relativity. And there's currently some uh, hint, very tentative hint that um, measurements may prefer a slightly different value of a uh, uh, model of gravity in the local universe. So that sets the stage for our new peculiar velocity catalog. Uh, this is based on SDSS data. It contains just over 30,000 galaxies and covers uh, the blue data here. I'm showing it alongside two other data sets here, which are currently the largest single sources of peculiar velocities we have. Uh, in red, that's the, Sloan, uh, the SDSS, sorry, in blue is the SDSS survey. In red is the well-known 60F. Uh, peculiar velocity survey, which was carried out by many of you here in Australia. And in green, we have a recent set of cosmic flows measurements using the Tully Fisher relationship. So the point is that these three basically don't overlap in the sky very much, which is good. Um, they also don't really overlap too much in redshift. Um, so the cosmic flows for data uh, has, tends to be at low redshift, and uh, 60F and the SDSS samples push to higher redshift. And in particular, with this new SSS data, we're trying to push up to redshift 0.1, um, which goes beyond what previous catalogs have done. So 
Uh, it's got a similar number of galaxies, 260F at low redshift. And so by low, I mean below 0.05-ish. Um, but actually has twice the number density because it's confined to a smaller sky area. And it also extends to larger redshift. And the fact that it's almost fully independent from either of these other two uh, very popular surveys means they have very complementary constraining power. So the SCSS um, sample is, uh, oh, this sample is selected from SCSS data. We've trimmed it to a magnitude limit in the R band of 17. And we've also added a whole bunch of additional cuts to return only photometric ellipticals. Um, uh, only photometric ellipticals which have very little H alpha in their spectrum and which also have robust velocity dispersion measurements. I'm not going to go over all the cuts we apply here. Um, suffice to say that uh, if you have any questions about the exact characterization of the data, I can answer them on Slack. Uh, alongside this data, we are producing uh, 2048 uh, realistic simulations uh, that replicate this data. And by replicate, I mean they replicate both in terms of the clustering of the data. So we put these uh, baked galaxies in realistic dark matter simulations and we put them in in a way such that you recover the correct galaxy power spectrum, which I'm showing on the left here, uh, which is basically to say that the average of the mock clustering matches the data. So a very good precision. Uh, and also each of the mock galaxies that we have in each of our simulations uh, has errors which are characteristic of the data as well. So here I'm showing a plot on the right of the error on the uh, surface brightness of the galaxies in the data and in the mocks uh, as a function of absolute magnitude. And really the takeaway from this plot is that the contours lie on top of the hex bins. So the hex bins are the data, the contours are the mocks, and we reproduce both the mean and the scatter very well. So the reason we have these mocks uh, is to test our methods of fitting the fundamental plane to the data and uh, to see how well we can get accurate pure velocities. So the method we use to fit the fundamental plane is this maximum likelihood method, uh, which assumes the fundamental plane is drawn from a 3D Gaussian. Uh, this method has quite a long history, uh, dating back for the last sort of 20 years to some of the early uh, ENIR and EFAR surveys, and was also used for the 60F uh, pure velocity sample. Uh, the reason is because it's quite nice and quite simple. 3D Gaussian is basically one of the most simple models you can get. Um, and what this allows us to do, if we assume this model, is we can write down basically our vector of, of, of fundamental plane measurements. So this mu here contains the surface brightness, uh, effective radius, and velocity dispersion of each of our galaxies. And then CN here encapsulates both intrinsic scatter in our empirical relationship, uh, and also the measurement errors on each of those three quantities. Um, we also weight the likelihood to account for missing galaxies, so galaxies which fall below our magnitude limits, and uh, have a normalization here, which accounts for the fact that we might have cuts in our data, such as in the velocity dispersion. Uh, so th this method works extremely well for fitting the data. So on the plot here, I'm showing the best fit fundamental plane we get from our SDSS data. Uh, the hex bins here show the data points, um, and red is the one-to-one -one line, which given the axis I've chosen to plot is the fundamental plane. And the contours here represent uh, the average over 2048 mocks. And on the right-hand side, I'm just showing the distribution of fundamental plane parameters we obtained from both the data and the mocks, just to show that um, the method we're using reproduces the input to the mocks very well, which is the red line, um, and the data is characteristic, or the mocks are characteristic of the data. Uh, so this uh, doesn't come without its own difficulties, though. And so one thing we found with the SDSS pure velocity catalog is that pushing out to redshift 0.1 uh, really does make systematics so, so much more important. Um, and they're already an issue when you're trying to do um, empirical distance relationships. I mean, you can ask anyone in the supernova communities or Carly Fisher or fundamental plane uh, communities that the um, systematics are a real big issue. Uh, but when we're pushing out to Richard 0.1, we have to consider things which we might have assumed we wouldn't have to worry about too much. And the first of these is to make sure that things like, oops, sorry, my computer touch frozen, here we go. Um, make sure that any data cuts you apply aren't distance dependent. So this can include things like if you've used uh, visual inspection on your data, um, when you're going to slightly higher redshift, like 0.1, it could be that you just get less efficient at classifying galaxies. Um, it could be that your spectral, your instrument you're using to get your spectrum might be less efficient at, uh, at detecting H alpha uh, and all these other things which you have to basically very carefully go through. And we have with the SCSS data. Very small differences in velocity dispersions that you measure within your galaxies can be very important. So typically anything on the order of five to 10 kilometers a second can suddenly cause a very large systematic. 
uh, if it's coherent across your sample. Uh, you also have to deal with precise conversion between magnitude, sizes, surface brightness, and that's because these small one plus z errors that you might introduce by forgetting them uh, introduce uh, and become, become very important. So things like surface brightness dimming, k-corrections, and of course there's the always ubiquitous Malkus bias, which always affects um, data as you go to higher redshift. And so here's an example of what might happen if you uh, neglect one of these things. So here I'm showing on the right a plot of some mocks where I neglected the uh, k-corrections when I did the Malkus bias correction. So this is a very subtle thing, which is very easy to forget. Uh, and the point of this plot is to show that you basically get a bias in your pure velocities. So delta D here is effectively a proxy for pure velocity, um, which increases with redshift. And if you'd made this mistake in a smaller sample, which goes to lower redshift, uh, the impact would be you might find an offset of perhaps 100 kilometers seconds. Um, but which would be within the expected var uh, variance due to cosmic variance, which is in these error bars. But once you go out to redshift point one, very soon these small systematics can become enormous outflows or inflows in your data. Cool. You're over your talk so, now. Okay, cool, yeah. And so one thing we've done is to um, improve the method we're using by uh, coming up with better ways to include mountain spikes. So let me jump um, to um, the future work. Uh, or the conclusions of this uh, talk. So uh, hopefully I've convinced you that we've got this new catalog of pure velocities, which provides a new sample of about 30,000 pure velocity measurements. Um, and these are essential for local universe cosmology and cosmography. Uh, cosmography and uh, this new data has enabled us to push the boundaries both in terms of depth and number density. Thanks. Great, thanks, Colin. I um, hope I didn't hurry you up too much at the end there. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I can't see any on Slack yet. Uh, List is asking if you take evolution into account. Uh, yes. So when we convert from um, magnitudes to uh, and radii to the fundamental plane parameters, we include an evolution correction. Um, although it's quite simple, it's simply just a constant times redshift. Um, although that's found to be a good fit to uh, other SCSS ellipticals. So how much of an increase in numbers is this compared to previous ones? I think you mentioned it. But... Yeah, so this is about a factor of three larger than uh, any previous single survey and is actually um, larger than all previous measurements combined by a factor of 1.5 or nearly two. Awesome. I don't see any more questions popping up online now, so we might catch up that extra minute we lost at the beginning and um, move on to the next talk. Uh, thanks, Colin, again. Uh, next, we have um, Benjamin Roberts. Uh, are you there, Benjamin? Yes, excellent. Cool. Also nearby to me. Um, take it away. Um, okay, so uh, can you see the slides in a second that is coming up? Probably. Bring our shared window to the front. Okay. And now you can see the PDF. Okay. Uh, go around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not full screen yet, but we can see it. Okay. Well, um, and if I change the slides, okay, that's good. Yep. Looks like you're on slide three now. Right. Uh, still or? Still. Oh, okay. Let's uh, stop trying to do full screen and I'll just. Now we can see the first page. Okay, great. Um, all right, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some work that we did uh, a little while ago looking for a variation of the fine structure constant around the supermassive black hole in the galactic center. Um, so this is work that was done um, as a collaboration from, from several groups and it was largely led um, by Aurelien Hees, who's at CERT in Paris, and Tuan Do from UCLA. Um, and because it was a work combining uh, several different groups, I will only be an expert on 
uh, a small subset of what I'm going to be talking about. So um, please feel free to ask questions, but uh, don't be too upset if I can't answer all of them. I will try my best though. Okay, so very generally, we want to, um, we all know that the standard model and general relativity is an extremely successful theory. Um, but we also know that it's likely incomplete. For example, it uh, doesn't describe uh, dark matter or dark energy, and it can't explain, for example, the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Um, so there must be something else beyond there. Uh, and very generally, two different ways that you can approach this problem of doing fundamental uh, physics tests is we can measure a known quantity with very high precision and then compare it to theory and see if everything is consistent. Um, but another, another approach that we can take is to look for an unknown signal. And this is the case where essentially you're expecting to find zero. And that means that if you do find anything, it's immediately evidence for new physics beyond the standard model. And so an example of that is uh, the equivalence principle or looking for violations of it, um, which we can ask in the question, are the laws of nature the same everywhere in the universe? And that brings me to my talk, which is on uh, fundamental physics using the black hole at the galactic center. So if you're looking for um, violation of the equivalence principle, there's many good reasons to do this. For example, lots of um, various theories beyond the standard model um, can predict uh, violations of the equivalence principle. What I'm particularly going to be talking about is a local or environmental dependence of the fundamental constants of nature. Um, and if we observe that, then obviously we're observing uh, evidence for physics outside of the standard model. So what do I mean by that? So in this example, we're looking at variation of the fine structure constant, that is alpha. And how do you look for something like that? Well, in an atom, the atomic energy levels depend on this constant alpha. So if that constant alpha were to take a different value, the energy levels in an atom would shift and therefore the transition frequencies. And that's the observable that we can look for. Um, and so if, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the, um, uh, we can parameterize the sensitivity in the, um, in, you know, that, that links the, sh the shift in the fine structure constant to the shift in an observable transition frequency by this um, factor K, which is a sensitivity coefficient that must be calculated um, from first principles. But that can be done. So once we know these, we can link the observable uh, shift in a frequency to the fundamental parameter, which is a variation of the fine structure constant. Uh, and for various technical reasons that I'm not going to go into in too much detail, um, for any of this to make sense, we need to make sure that we are measuring uh, essentially dimensionless quantities. So what we need to do is look at uh, ratios of transition frequencies. So it means you need several uh, transition frequencies at the same place. And what you then get is your observable, which is this um, uh, ratio of transition frequencies can be linked via these sensitivity coefficients uh, back to the fundamental parameter. Um, so we can do this search uh, around, oh, well, in many places, but one place you can do it is around um, using stars around the galactic center. And the reason that we're interested to do it here is in case that there is a link between gravitational potential and the fine structure constant. So what we need to do is observe the spectrum of stars close to the um, galactic center in high gravitational potential and if there is any difference in the transition frequencies between those stars and on Earth, then that can be evidence for a variation of the fine structure constant. Now, I should mention that um, some of the stars that are best measured and closest to the galactic center are not appropriate because they mostly have hydrogen uh, lines, which for reasons I'll talk about in a bit are not, um, not appropriate for this type of measurement. We need old type stars with heavy atoms in them, um, particular titanium and silicon became good um, uh, candidates in this search. Um, so the stars orbiting the galactic center have been observed uh, with high precision for quite a while now. And uh, this is the part that I'm definitely not an expert in, but this is um, uh, obviously some of the, um, the work from this has uh, culminated recently in the, um, the Nobel Prize in 2020. Um, so anyway, this can be done with very high precision and there's lots of groups that are working very hard on getting these measurements uh, done very well. And relevant for our search, there are six old type stars that we identified as promising candidates. Uh, and essentially what we need is stars with many different lines and lines from atomic absorption lines, that is, that have different sensitivities to the fine structure constant. 
Um, so yeah, so we identified several of these stars and we have enough data. Now in order to, um, in order to, to do these measurements, we need to be very sure that the lines that we're looking at are indeed the lines that we think they are. And that means we need each, each line to be, uh, um, you know, unambiguously uh, identifiable. And that means out of the, you know, thousand odd possibilities, uh, it turns out there's only about 15 that were um, uh, separate enough for us to, um, to use uh, effectively. But in any case, we have these 15 lines um, from, from this spectrum that we can end up using. Um, so to link these observations then to a fundament, to the, um, to a possible variation of the fine structure constant, we have to uh, fit um, essentially to this equation. So we need to fit each individual line uh, individually because the biggest systematic obviously will be um, the relativistic and velocity redshift. So we have to fit for the redshift and for a potential variation of the fine structure constant uh, at the same time. Um, and because of that, it also means we, you, you know, you need more lines than you would otherwise thought. And we also need to know these K coefficients, the sensitivity coefficients for each individual line, which need to be computed. Um, so that's one of the parts that I contributed most to was ca calculating these um, sensitivity coefficients. I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially we um, do uh, large scale calculations of atomic structure. And these are atoms with a very large number of electrons. So the calculations are quite, um, uh, are quite detailed and involved. Uh, and in, 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 F, in effect, we um, literally vary the, the value of the fine structure constant from the beginning before solving the Schrodinger equation to calculate the, uh, the energy levels and wavelengths for a particular atom and then see how sensitive they are to variations in the constant. Uh, and then these K coefficients can be calculated for every one of those atoms. Um, and so here's just a table of some of the calculations. The numbers are not important, but the fact is that we calculated these K coefficients for a large number of, of these atoms. Um, and we did this using, sorry, I should have said that back here. We did this using um, code uh, AMBIT, which is written by Emily Carl and Julian Berengut. And this is um, open source and available and it's um, uh, very high precision code that allows um, calculations for these very complex atoms to be done, which um, existing, well, previously existing codes would, would be very difficult to do these kind of calculations. And as an aside, um, from doing this work, we probably did the most accurate calculation of silicon to date, and we were able to do fairly accurate calculations for iron, which has eight valence electrons and is a notoriously difficult case. Um, so what we saw in the end, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, we found no um, evidence for a variation of the fine structure constant around um, the black hole. And uh, we constrained it here to parts in 10 to the six. Um, and potentially more interestingly, this is what we're actually looking at is in certain models of, um, well, certain uh, models beyond the standard model the fine structure constant may be linked to the gravitational potential. And um, just very generally, this is often parameterized with this uh, term beta. So we have also found no evidence for a non-zero beta, um, but we have constrained this as well. And it's while this is certainly not the first time such a value has been constrained and our results are also by no means the most um, constraining uh, result that has been done, it is the first time that it's been done in a black hole. Um, so that's sort of interesting in and of itself. And so just to summarize, we, this is what we've done. We've um, constrained the variation of the fine structure constant and the dependence of the fine structure constant uh, on the gravitational potential around a black hole. And we think this is quite interesting because it's showing another, um, another avenue for, for doing fundamental physics using stars in the galactic center. But most importantly, this, um, this work was a, a really just initial results based on incidental data. These were not dedicated observations, so we're just using data that was already existing. And there's currently a proposal which is being led by Tuan Do at UCLA, which is underway to do um, dedicated measurements of stars. And the main way that this is, um, that we hope to improve is to have uh, measurements of more lines um, 
of stars which are closer to the galactic center and therefore at much higher gravitational potential. And due to a number of things, we're hoping to get up to a five orders of magnitude improvement in the precision for the, um, for the sensitivity to this beta parameter. That might be a little bit optimistic, but that's uh, roughly the, the maximum that, we, that we're hoping for. Um, okay, so that's what I've got. I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, really cool stuff. Thank you very much. Um, there's one question I can see so far in Slack from Anna Syme, which is what kind of approximations do you have to consider when calculating K? Do you do a full relativistic calculation? Right, good question. Yeah, thanks. So we do do a full relativistic calculation. It turns out the relativistic part is actually not the, the hard part once you um, you know, you use the Dirac equation instead of the regular Schrodinger equation and all the relativistic parts uh, are just in there automatically. But what does turn out to be the very hard part is accounting for the correlations between um, the various electrons. So we start out with a frozen approximation and then allow uh, excitations and, and correlations between the electrons. Um, but that blows up computationally very, very quickly. So you have to find clever ways to um, get high accuracy without, uh, without exploding the computing time too much. That's definitely where the main problem comes in. Yeah. Great. So Luke Barnes asks, how does this compare to similar experiments in the gravitational field of Earth? Um, yeah, so I, I raised through that part, but there is a little graph here. And so, um, in, well, in the gravitational field of Earth, I can't remember what the, the, the variation alpha is there, um, but we are roughly similar to um, uh, in, in terms of the constraint on this beta parameter to uh, measurements that have been done um, by Webb et al near um, a white dwarf star. So um, I, I think the, the atomic clocks on Earth, we have uh, better sensitivity to the, the gravitational potential, but I, I would have to look that up. But it, yeah, it's... Um... Cool. Uh, so I'll t do one more question. Um, this one's from Balu, who asks, how do you, oh no, uh, Nicole's one was first, sorry. Um, it's very cool. How strong was the gravitational potential relatively for the stars you had in this analysis? And how much stronger is the gravitational potential of the stars you plan to look at? I guess okay, that's that, that's a good, so the, the gravitational potential uh, in, in units of, of, of per C squared is on the order of parts in 10 to the minus six, I think for these stars from memory. Um, and I, I think they're hoping to get it uh, up to an order of magnitude improvement on that, but uh, maybe don't quote me on that because I, I can't remember the, the details of those stars, but they, they're certainly hoping to get a, a, a fairly significant improvement. One of the hard things is um, the, the sort of lines that we're looking for are very different from the lines that most people are normally interested in. They, they get much better um, spectroscopy with the hydrogen lines, I think, and we're interested in slightly different things. So it's not, it hasn't been the focus yet of, of dedicated measurements. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we better move on. Very interesting stuff. There is a couple more questions in the chat. If you want to jump on Slack and answer those, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so our next speaker is Mitchell Dixon. Um, yeah, I'll just show my slides. Um, that working? Yep. Uh, awesome. That was saying it's starting. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So, my name is Mitchell Dixon, and I'm a PhD candidate at Swinburne University. And today, my talk will be on uh, Type 1a supernova host galaxies and the Hubble constant. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so as you've heard it from a few speakers today, the Hubble tension is currently a really big problem in cosmology today. And it's due to this growing discrepancy in a lot of methods in measuring how fast the universe is expanding. So we have the early universe, which is the um, indirect way of measuring H0 with things such as the cosmic microwave background and the late universe, which makes use of uh, standard candles and the astronomical distance light. And this uh, figure is a great representation over the last sort of two decades, how uh, these sort of main methods have uh, basically reduced their uncertainties quite a bit, but have reached a point where they're starting to diverge. 
So between the Safed and the cosmic microwave background, there's between four and six sigma. And also, as mentioned, you can have the, see the tip of the red giant branch, which has a sort of medium value. But ultimately, even there's still a lot of work needs to be done. And is currently why this is a, a crisis in cosmology. So a really useful um, steady candle is the type 1a supernova. But importantly, they need to be standardized in, um, for use in measuring distances. So here's an example of um, some of the supernova light curves before and after um, corrections are applied. And these corrections are important and include uh, things such as the uh, peak magnitude, the stretch or the width, uh, the color. And ultimately these, along with um, other fitting parameters and the absolute magnitude form the, uh, how we can find the observed distance modulus used in uh, determining yeah, measuring distances. So ultimately now we have this distance modulus, we can then define a, a Hubble residual, which is the deviation between this observed distance modulus and the inferred value given our current uh, Lambda CDM model and um, at a given dimension. So um, this highway project, basically the broader scope is constraining possible systematic factors which impact measurements of the Hubble constant um, with the astronomical distance title. And we aim to do this by utilizing galaxy spectra to investigate if there's any uh, Hubble residual correlations with uh, their host galaxy environment and if any of these will be important going forward in constraining systematics. So a lot of work has been done uh, with a lot of these different types of um, Hubble residual correlations with their galaxies. And these include things such as um, metallicity, the stellar age, star formation rates. And uh, one of the big ones currently is known as, uh, there is a mass correlation known as the mass step. And this figure uh, shows basically where we have, so after these light curve corrections, we have the more negative Hubble residuals, which are more luminous after correction, residing in galaxies that uh, have higher stellar masses in comparison to their counterparts. And it's this sort of uh, difference, which is uh, currently being investigated why or what the exact mechanism is behind uh, this result. And this could be due to things such as the intrinsic properties of the supernova, the local or global environment, or extrinsic factors such as dust. And ultimately, understanding the intrinsic scatter of these effects is important to improve in the Type 1a standard candle. So we'll be making use of, um, in our work, uh, Dark Energy Survey and Australian Dark Energy Survey. So DES is uh, basically maps out hundreds of millions of galaxies and has identified thousands of supernovae. And this is done across five optical filters using DEC cam in Chile. And here is a sort of just cool animation showing. So in the, across each of the DES fields, the red is the three year uh, sample of type 1As, which have been spectroscopically identified. And then we have the five year, which is the more recent sample, which are photometrically identified type 1As. And there's basically, as you can see, an order of magnitude difference. And this is quite substantial and allows a lot of different uh, analysis to be undertaken in this type of work. So then we have um, OSDES, which is uh, um, over at um, Science Spring Observatory in Western New South Wales at the AAT. And OSDES is a really useful follow-up survey to DES and is able to um, measure the spectroscopic redshift of these galaxies that have been identified to host the supernova transient and also importantly obtain a spectrum, which is what we are able to use uh, in our analysis. So now that we have our, our DES five year sample, after making some necessary cuts, uh, we get around 1,034 OSDES host galaxies that we can use. And we can now apply light curve, light curve fitting parameters to estimate our observed distance modulus. So here we show without and then applying these light curve corrections from then we can then fit our uh, data and obtain our Hubble residuals for each of these uh, objects. Now the question with those there's galaxies is can we find any um, Hubble residual correlations uh, that might be evident? And the first step now we have our sample is we can now split into different Hubble residual bins. Then we can we choose to co-add the OSDES host spectra into stacks. And the reason we do this is because the OSDES individual uh, spectra is 
uh, it's a, a low signal to noise. So um, by cloning them together, we are able to uh, put them in a much more suitable condition for uh, spectral fitting, which is what we're using to extract information about the stellar um, uh, the ga galaxy environment. So for this spectral fitting, we utilize uh, penalized pixel fitting known as PPXF to extract information about the uh, stellar and or gas kinematics from our Olstead spectra. And this enables us to obtain uh, things such as the cell population age, um, bed lucidity, mass light ratio, and also the relative flux of emission and absorption lines. And here's an example of the uh, quality of one of the fits to the OSS coated spectra. And we can see the blue representing the data, the black is the best fit to the um, stellar templates, and then we have the red and green representing the stellar and gas components respectively. So now that we um, have each of these individual stacks, we can then run PPXF on each of them and see what we can um, obtain. And from here, we can see, so that, uh, from left to right, we have the metallicity, uh, the equivalent width, which we use the um, oxygen 2 emission line as an indicator of the star formation rate. We then have the mass to light ratio and also the log stellar age. And interestingly, there's no obvious correlation with either of those uh, properties with Hubble residual. And especially when we then plot the average stellar mass obtained from the DES photometry for each of these stacks, we see the much stronger um, mass trend in comparison to the weak ones from the spectra. And this is um, expected, uh, the mass correlation is expected due to uh, what's been seen in a lot of supernova surveys and especially over this sort of stellar, stellar mass range, uh, the trend is quite steep and suggests that um, maybe this, um, the mechanism for it isn't due to the stellar populations themselves. So um, basically the next thing we can do is look into, well, uh, what are the effects of dust in maybe explaining this mass step? And we make use of the Barmer decrement. So this is the ratio of hydrogen emission lines. And uh, the main one is H alpha and H beta, but in our case, we, um, as our sample is at a sort of median redshift of 0.55, um, H alpha becomes redshifted off our spectral range and therefore isn't uh, useful considering the lower number of objects that will have that uh, contain that emission one. So we make use of um, the second one, which involves H gamma, and that ratio corresponds to. Um, the theoretical ratio is 0.468. And here we plot uh, H gamma against H beta and uh, the dashed line corresponds to the expected ratio. Now, the important thing about the Barber decrement is that we any difference from the observed values to the theoretical values allows us to determine um, is there any reddening due to dust in our spectrum. Now, uh, another thing to note in this plot is that, so we have the more positives, the color code here is the redder um, points, uh, tend to have larger line fluxes. And this is generally a sign of a more dustier um, environment and also one that may have a higher star formation rate. Uh, so now that we have our um, our Barber ratios, we can then plot against the Hubble residual for each of those, and we see a much more obvious uh, trend with Hubble residual. So here we have the um, green line representing our fit to the data, and we can see also by showing here uh, the reddening vector um, calculated using uh, the method in Cardelli et al. 1989 that our, um, this appears to be consistent with reddening with the more positive and fainter Hubble residuals being more impacted by dust. And this is important to see as uh, in a lot of recent research, um, dust is definitely becoming one of the more uh, promising avenues to explain these um, mass step after light curve corrections. And it's the ability to split um, up these dust uh, impacts going forward that will ultimately help us hopefully constrain a lot of these calibration uncertainties. So uh, just a sort of summary of this um, sort of talk today. So the Hubble tension is a massive crisis in cosmology today as um, 
as I hope is obvious. Um, Type 1A supernova are extremely useful as standardizable candles and ultimately whatever we can do to improve them going forward is going to be extremely beneficial. And one of the areas is going to be through calibration systematics so that they will um, impact our measurement of the Hubble constant. And these will be due to things such as the intrinsic scatter in the Hubble diagram or environmental correlations that we may not be uh, properly accounting for. And the sort of main from this talk, um, from our research, the mass correlation um, that has been observed in a lot of studies, we can't currently explain with the stellar populations obtained from our OSS spectra, but there does appear to be indication that dust has um, a high importance going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, so there's a couple of questions here. The first one's from um, Leonard, who says, thanks for a great talk. If you're aware of it, can you comment on the recent work of Mortzell et al, which is the paper that's entitled, The Hubble Tension Bites the Dust, Sensitivity of the Hubble Constant Determination to Cepheid Color Calibration. Uh, he says that they show that allowing for di diverse extinguishing properties of extragalactic dust, you get a different Cepheid calibration and a lower value of H naught of 66.9. Do you know of that one? Um, I haven't read that article, but it's something I've sort of seen mentioned. And I think it does seem like a very important thing taking into account dust, because I know the tip of the red giant branch as well, that's a very similar sort of improvement in them having a lower value. So I think going forward, it does look like if we're properly accounting for these types of things, the value uh, does look like it will drop and hopefully that'll maybe yeah, lessen the gap between the earlier measurements to the late. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, um, Zhu Zhang Quinn has asked, uh, can you also talk a bit about the systematics in CMB measurements? In particular, it looks like earlier CMB measurements, although having larger uncertainties, are not consistent with latest results in one sigma. So, by which I am inferring that the uh, you're talking about um, the difference in the CMB measurements there, perhaps, uh, between like WMAP and Planck? Um, yeah, so I don't know too much about it just because I guess I've been more focused on the local sort of measurements, but I think, yeah, it is interesting those, I guess, the CMB and Planck, well, those measurements have such small uncertainties, it's a lot harder for, I guess, there to be resolved in that tension due to the yeah, the overlapping being much more difficult. Like, I guess in the coming years with all these new um, observational surveys coming forward, that these systematics will be reduced. But um, yeah, so I don't know, I think it's going to be an interesting problem for the next coming years. <laughs> yeah, I know that one's not in your, exactly in your, um, re related to your research. So that's a difficult one to answer. Um, Great. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat, and we're basically um, or at time, so we might leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm very interested to see how much the dust can contribute uh, to all of these different things. Uh, and now, moving on to the next talk, uh, we have Georgie Taylor giving her talk uh, again on supernova, but now developing supernova models for cosmology. All yours, Georgie. Great, thanks, Tim. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Georgie Taylor. I'm a PhD student here at the Australian National University, and I'm working on the modeling of type 1A supernovae um, light curves for cosmology applications. Um, so even though, as we've seen from Mitchell's talk and a few earlier talks in the ASA, um, there's some great research being done into supernovae in Australia, it is still a little bit of a fringe area for this audience. So um, today I'm going to try and keep this talk quite general and hopefully accessible. Um, but of course, if anyone would ever like to have any more detailed discussions on type 1A supernovae in either question time or the ASA Slack or just via email, I'm always down for that. But for today, we're going to cover the basic mechanisms of type 1A supernovae and how they're used in a cosmology analysis. I'll then walk you through some of my contributions to the field which mainly focus on supernova spectroscopy and light curve modeling. So let's start with the definition. And I should say, when I say supernova in this talk, I'm always talking about type 1As. The rest of them don't exist for me. So if I say supernova, it's always 1As. 
These 1As occur in carbon oxygen white dwarfs with slow rates of rotation when triggered by some interaction with a companion star. Now there's still some uncertainty around the exact progenitor systems for 1As, and we actually now do have evidence for multiple channels for explosions. But fortunately, my work is only concerned with what happens after the supernova explosion is triggered. So we don't need to go into the intricacies of single degenerate versus double degenerate progenitor systems today. All we need to know is that a white dwarf gains matter from some companion star. But white dwarfs are unable to expand and cool in the way that main sequence stars can. can. So the increased pressure from this accreted mass raises the core temperature of the white dwarf. And as it approaches the Chandrasekhar mass, it enters a period of convection that typically lasts about a thousand years. Just a reminder, the Chandrasekhar mass represents the maximum mass that a fully degenerate object like a white dwarf can remain stable, which is about 1.4 solar masses. At some point during this simmering phase, carbon fusion ignites, which is followed quickly by oxygen fusion. And since the fusion rate is proportional to the fourth power of temperature, and this white dwarf is getting hotter and hotter, a runaway fusion reaction occurs within seconds of reignition. The energy released in these few seconds is on order of the total energy radiated by the sun over its entire lifespan. And so unsurprisingly, our poor white dwarf is ripped apart in a type 1a supernova explosion. These are some of the biggest explosions in the universe with matter flying apart at up to 6% of the speed of light and a peak brightness of 5 billion solar luminosities. The standard explosion mechanism, combined with the high luminosity, makes Type 1A supernovae excellent standardizable candles for measuring cosmological distances, as we've already heard. Accurate distances can be obtained by comparing the apparent brightness of observed supernovae to their expected brightness. And as they outshine their host galaxies out to a redshift of about two, we can constrain a big chunk of the expansion history of the universe through this one class of object. They can then be used by supernova cosmology analyses, such as the Dark Energy Survey or the upcoming Legacy Survey of Space and Time to measure cosmological parameters. So here are the steps for performing a supernova cosmology analysis. Obviously, this is a bit of a simplified breakdown. There are a lot of intricacies that are often analysis specific, but this covers the key components. Because we can't really predict when or where supernova will occur, dedicated surveys repeatedly image patches of the sky looking for any stars that suddenly increase in brightness. Once this is detected, a spectroscopic follow-up observation is often triggered to classify the target as a type 1a and to obtain a redshift. A supernova is photometrically observed over multiple filter bands and epochs to try and capture as much of its light curve information as practical. And the quality of this light curve depends on things like the phase of detection, the survey cadence and calibration, and of course the weather. We can then fit a light curve model to the observed data to recover some supernova parameters that will allow us to calculate distances. The quality of this fit depends not only on the data, but also on the accuracy of the light curve model. The fit shown here is from SALT2, which is currently the industry standard model for type 1a supernovae. We can then use the supernova parameters recovered from the SALT2 fit to measure redshift independent distances via the modified trip equation. And then those distances can be compared to the, redshift gathered, uh, the redshifts gathered from spectra to produce a Hubble diagram. And finally, we can take the Hubble diagram and through some complicated math, measure cosmological parameters such as the mass density omega matter or the dark energy equation of state parameter W. So this figure is from the Dark Energy Survey's three-year supernova analysis in 2019, which constrains W to about 5%. The aim now is to achieve a 1% precision measurement of W. So that was your two-minute introduction to a supernova cosmology analysis. In reality, it takes years of collaborative effort um, with tens to hundreds of people often working remotely on individual pieces of this big puzzle. So I come in in a small piece at step two which is the sweet spot after the data has been collected and reduced, but before the co complicated cosmology begins. So my role in the Dark Energy Survey supernova analysis has so far been to work on the fitting of a SALT2 model to supernova light curves. And specifically, I've been looking closely at the model itself and how it can be updated to give improved light curve fits. So because of the aforementioned uncertainty of type 1a progenitors and mechanisms, we don't actually have a theoretical light curve model. 
Instead, we have empirical models like SALT2, which are trained and observed data. The SALT2 model defines the emitted flux at a particular phase and wavelength. It's determined by two sets of parameters, the model components, which are obtained during the training process, and the supernova parameters, color stretch and amplitude, which are unique to each object. A light curve fitter then takes the fluxes from some observed supernova light curve, along with the SALT2 model components, and determines the supernova parameters, which can then be used, as we saw, to obtain a distance measure. The training of SALT2 is an iterative chi-squared process, which takes the underlying SALT2 model mechanics, a training sample of 1A data, and some initial conditions, such as definitions of photometric systems, and produces a SALT2 surface. And so a surface is just the set of outputs that you get from one training of SALT2. So you can think of it like a version of the SALT2 model. You can produce a new surface by changing either the training sample or the initial conditions. But of course, if you change the underlying model, it's no longer SALT2. And until recently, the industry standard SALT2 surface was the joint light curve analysis or JLA surface that was produced by Batuli et al. in 2014. Now I say until recently because earlier this year I released an updated SALT2 surface that implements two major changes to the initial conditions. SALT2 T21 was trained with updated Milky Way dust extinction and photometric calibrations. The Milky Way reddening in the JLA surface was defined by dust maps which were found to overpredict reddening by 14%. Changes in the amount of reddening caused by Milky Way dust affect the color of type 1A supernovae and therefore the distance measures. So this was an important update. We also updated the flux zero points of a number of photometric systems by an average of 10 millimag. So most supernova analyses actually combine data from different surveys within their sample, and the calibration between these different photometric systems is imprecise, particularly for older systems. So this uncertainty from the photometric calibration can contribute up to two thirds to the total systematic uncertainty budget for a modern analysis. So again, this was an important update to the model. We then tested the impact of these changes by performing two supernova cosmology analyses based on the Dark Energy Survey's three-year supernova analysis. The only change between each analysis was the choice of JLA or updated T21 surface. But when comparing the results of these two analyses, we found a change of 0.015 in the Dark Energy Equation of State parameter, which represents about a 1.5% change in W. So we can see that retraining SALT2 with these updated initial conditions, as in the T21 surface, was an important step in this time of precision supernova cosmology. But these updated initial conditions are actually only one way of producing an improved SALT2 surface. We can also make updates to the training sample. So the JLA and T21 surfaces were both trained on the same training sample of 420 type 1A supernovae as shown here. And now we have data for about a thousand more type 1A supernovae that we could include in a SALT2 training sample. And in fact, we do intend to do this in the future. But most of that data is photometric and the spectral sample that we do have so far has been observed somewhat randomly. You can see the distribution of phase and wavelength here. So now we're wondering what a SALT2 model might look like if it was trained on a strategically targeted spectral sample instead. So for example, how does a SALT2 surface perform when trained on a spectral sample that was observed at peak phase versus one trained on a spectral sample that was evenly sampled across phase space? Similarly, what are the effects of wavelength range and resolution or host galaxy contamination in the spectral sample? So all of these sort of selection effects haven't been investigated before in the context of the SALT2 model, but in the age of precision supernova cosmology, they could become important. And fortunately, all of these effects can be tested using simulations, which I'll be doing to determine the optimal spectral training sample for a SALT2 light model. This optimal training sample will then be obtained through a new supernova observing program called DBAS. So DBAS is a three year survey that will use the dark energy camera on the four meter Blanco telescope to observe 750 low redshift supernovae. In combination with the existing data set of 2000 type 1A supernovae already observed with DECCAM, this will produce the world's most powerful data set of both low and high redshift supernovae observed on the same well calibrated telescope system that will not be surpassed for at least a decade. 
Spectroscopic follow-up of DBAS will be performed with wives, the wide field spectrograph mounted on the ANU 2.3 meter. So WIVES is an integral field unit that records an optical spectrum at every pixel of the region that it images, which among other benefits, allows us to disentangle the supernova spectrum from its host galaxy. Our survey team here at the ANU has been hard at work developing our survey infrastructure and observing our first handful of targets. And we're already excited to see what science we can do with this consistent high quality data set that will replace the poorly calibrated historical low redshift sample of type 1a supernovae. But I think that brings me to the end of my time. So in the last 12 minutes, we've seen how type 1a supernovae are formed, measured and used for a cosmology analysis. We've also examined the SALT2 model and the different ways it can be improved. And we've learned about a new survey where Australia will play a crucial role in collecting a world-class sample of type 1a supernovae. So as always, thank you for your attention and I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks, Georgie. Perhaps all around. Uh, okay, does anyone have any questions they'd like to put in the chat? Uh, Leonard has one uh, who says, thanks for a great talk. Uh, before feeding data into SALT2, what kind of checks are performed to make sure that the life cu light curves fed in are actually type 1a supernovae? Uh, for ah. example, are there other cosmological effects or astrophysical processes that have similar light curves that need to be filtered out? That is a great question. So most of the time our objects are classified um, in the current training samples spectroscopically. So we are able to constrain um, type 1a supernova spectra quite well. They're quite unique um, compared to other objects. And I'm not aware of any um, imposters that could get through. We are now moving to photometric classification, which could become potentially a problem for future models that include uh, data that was classified in that way. We haven't investigated that yet, but that definitely is going to be coming up in the near future. Yu Shang asks, does the uncertainties in, for example, W reduce with the updated SALT2? Uh, it doesn't look so in the contour plots. Uh, only very slightly. So the interesting thing about updating the initial conditions is that we're not providing any extra data. So the model itself doesn't know that it's more accurate or less accurate. It just knows that it's different. So we don't really see any significant um, reduction in W uncertainties yet. Um, I would say the way that we would see a reduction in that is through increasing the training sample, which will reduce the statistical uncertainties in the model and that will trickle down. But um, it's a small contribution to the total uncertainty in W anyway. Mm -hmm. So one last question from Stuart. Will you still report core collapse supernovae from DBAS via ATELs, even though they supposedly don't exist? <laughs> um, yeah, so that is a great question. We're actually not a discovery survey. So DBAS itself um, on DECCAM, the photometric side of it, in, follows up ATELs. So uh, it's um, kind of targeted. So hopefully we shouldn't have too many uh, core collapse sneak through anyway, but I believe um, the ones that are there should already be reported because we're getting our um, targets from ATELs anyway. Excellent. Okay, thanks you very much, Georgie. And to come to the end of this session, we've got Wan San Ting, who's gonna tell us about how many elements matter. Uh, well, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we okay. can see the, not full screen, we can see the browser window as well, but it looks fine. Okay, yeah, yeah we use the browser the windows, that's fine. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, uh, I thank you, the organizer for the uh, opportunity uh, it's actually my first uh, ASA meeting, so that's uh, quite exciting uh, for me. Uh, so uh, my, name, my name is Johansson. I am a new faculty at the ANU, so I mostly work on uh, the Milky Way and also on machine uh, learning. So, so I thought I want to use this uh, opportunity to talk about what is the uh, di dimensionality of the uh, chem uh, chemical space of star. And uh, so if you are not very uh, attuned to this field, you might ask why this uh, question is uh, interesting in the first place. Um, first, of course, we all know that we are now in this uh, big uh, era of large-scale osteoscopic uh, survey. So in Australia, we have GALA, so uh, uh, Stone 5 will soon uh, start to take data, and then we have Weave, Formos, and then GAIA, ESO, and Apogee. So 
all this also way what they try to do, of course, is to try to measure the high resolution spectra from star, from which we can uh, measure a different uh, elemental abundances of stars. And so the idea here is that because different uh, elements are produced by a different channel, therefore, if we can measure many uh, abundances, it would be great. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the story is not as simple because uh, it depends on whether or not the abundances are highly degenerate uh, or not, right? So even you have d different channel, if you are in the left uh, hand side, most of the abundances are highly degenerate, then uh, you would not have many uh, independent uh, information. So the hope uh, back then was that you know we, the different abundances will have many independent uh, information. So we should measure many uh, different uh, abundances. But uh, uh, believe it or not, so this topic was uh, sort of like tackled by myself as an uh, undergraduate 10 years um, ago with Ken Freeman. We, we wrote a paper on the PCA on the chemical space. But in recent years, uh, there are lots of like a debate on the same topic um, again. So we thought we want to re revisit this uh, question with uh, David uh, uh, Weinberg. So, so, so what's the big picture here? So if you think about the simple chemical uh, uh, evolution of the Milky Way, the simplest way to understand that with, uh, is with this uh, Tinsley uh, diagram. So you look at the uh, alpha over our iron on the y-axis as a function of metallicity. So the story goes as, you know, you, you have some pristine gas in the Milky Way and after some time, some supernovae happens, it's like dropping ink into a bucket of water. So the ink will uh, diffuse uh, uh, over time. If the ISM mixing is uh, instantaneous, then you do not really care how the ink diffuse. What you really care is what is the integrated uh, stellar yield. And this will trace out what we call the, the chemical track. So of course, uh, the chemical track has been studied since the 1990s. It, it has been studied to depth. But of course, that's not the goal of, uh, of Galar, right? So one of the main goal of Galar is to understand if we can extract information beyond the chemical track. So more precisely, if I focus on a reference point, so for star with the same uh, alpha enhancement and metallicity for the other n minus two uh, a dimension, uh, is there any uh, useful uh, variation? And that question, of course, is uh, very tied to the simple question whether or not the ISM mixing is uh, instantaneous. So if the ISM mixing is uh, instantaneous, then uh, we, will, uh, we will be back to the one zone uh, models. So what, we, what I have just uh, described will be the full story. So uh, there is not much information beyond the chemical track. But lucky for us, of course, the ISM mixing is not uh, instantaneous, meaning that there are many uh, processes that are ongoing in the Milky Way, but each of these uh, processes will take time. Therefore, if you drop an ink into a bucket of, of, of water, uh, the ink will not be uh, immediately dispersed to the whole bucket of uh, water. So what it would happen is that uh, you will create some chemical uh, ripples in this high, high dimensional space. So that's sort of the high uh, level aspiration for many years. But the question is, can we quantify such uh, ripples in the chemical space? Uh, sort of like it's a BAO for the chemical space, right? So uh, this is where sort of the debate like, started in the last few years, because uh, some people think that uh, the ripple is so small uh, it's very impossible to find the ripples. And since it's impossible to find the ripples, then uh, there's no uh, reason to collect high, high resolution uh, spectra. So uh, there are quite, quite a few paper, but this paper actually is a good uh, summary of some of this finding. So what people have claimed is that even I do not measure the other uh, elemental uh, abundances, I can still infer the other uh, uh, abundances with only two numbers, with only the iron on NH or iron on magnesium, I can infer the other uh, abundances to about 0.02 dex. So people claim that in this case, why do you even care about uh, measuring the abundances? Because I can infer the, the other uh, abundances. And this is of course a very strong claim, and this is why it prompted us to uh, like revisit this question. Uh, so so the, the, what people have claimed is that if I condition on the iron and magnesium, the other abundances X over H are, are, are nothing but just noise. And as I mentioned, if this is true, then this is really bad for Gala because uh, not only for Gala, it's like for future as a way because then you would not need high resolution spectra in the first place. 
uh, good news for you, <laughs> that turned out to be wrong. Uh, and this is why we have tried to write this, but not be able to uh, clarify uh, some of this uh, misconception. So the main goal here, the game you want to play is to show that if I can somehow uh, describe this uh, conditional uh, distribution, I want to show that this uh, a conditional uh, distribution is not just noise. And some of the, the oversight that uh, people have been doing is that instead of quantifying the whole uh, distribution, most of the time people are looking at the second moment, but uh, they're only looking at the diagonal uh, entries of the second moment. So they're looking at the dispersion of, uh, uh, about the mean. Now, I would not bore you with the statistical uh, details here. So if for people who, who are interested, you can read the papers. But uh, it, it actually is shown you know, by Fisher in the 1921 that if you're looking at the co covariances uh, and you're looking at the diagonals uh, entries, it's actually very susceptible to the sampling noise. So some of the analogy that I love to use is that like think about cosmology, you hope to find the BAO. Of course, first you need to have enough a, a galaxy to overcome the sampling noise, but you also need to find the right frequency. And in both cases, like uh, in, in some of these studies that claim that you cannot find the ripples, they are not taking into account the sampling noise, but they are also looking at the wrong place. So it turns out that if you're looking at the right place, you cannot really find the ripples. But the question still is, how do you really quantify the whole uh, distribution uh, such that you can not uh, 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 only looking at the second moment, but you can uh, also look at the higher order uh, moments. And this, of course, is very tricky because what we really have is not the distribution, right? So what we have, the, what the nature gives us is an ensemble of the realization. So in this n-dimensional space, you have like a million star, but you want to turn this into a distribution. Of course, uh, at this point, you know, we, we heard talk about Qlin, uh, you can use a, a Gaussian mixture models or a, a Gaussian models, but of course uh, that will not make the cut because this is a very high dimensional space. It's also not a fundamental plane, so it's a very uh, nasty, right? So the question is how do you describe a, a, a very high dimensional uh, distribution? And this is where uh, machine learning can play a role. So the tools that we use is called the normalizing flow. So, so the idea is the following. So you want to turn an ensemble into a distribution. The classical way of doing that is to say, well, you know, I, I can write down a functional form P and then fit a uh, maximum uh, likelihood uh, estimator to estimate P. But of course, you know, this is very limiting because the, the family of P that we can write down is too simple, right? Gaussian or Bernoulli or whatever. So if you uh, come to this case, like th uh, this is still a simple 2D case, but you can imagine in this uh, double moon shape, it would be uh, really hard to write down a function P. So the insights of a uh, normalizing flow is to say, I want to use a neural network as a change of a variable. So we, even though I live in a very high dimensional space, but I can hope that find a neural network to turn that into a simpler uh, distribution. And in the, in the target space, this likelihood is much, uh, much uh, easier to define. And I also want to make sure that you can uh, invert the function. So you want to use a special type of neural network uh, that can really do the change of a variable. And this is a very uh, generic uh, uh, idea. I should mention that here we apply that to like uh, 25D. In cosmology, like, uh, like uh, 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 Euros or Selja is applying the normalizing flow to 500D, looking at the weak Lansing maps. So it's a very generic uh, idea to understand how do you describe a distribution without uh, resorting to some simple uh, a summary a statistic. So if you flip through the two, so this is the ensemble, this is the distribution. So you can see that uh, other distribution is doing a good job at describing the data. So with that, then you can start to extract higher order mo uh, a moment from this uh, distribution. So uh, of course, we did not go so fancy in this paper. So we uh, only look at the off uh, diagonals uh, entries of the second uh, moment. Just by looking at, at the off uh, diagonals uh, uh, entries, you can see that we, we can start to see this ripple. So what is uh, showing you here is the pairwise co correlation after conditioning on the chemical track. The, the thing that I do not have time to show is that this is also, we can show that uh, this is more than just the sampling noise and it's, uh, and it's also not the uh, measurement er uh, error. So uh, just to summarize, you know, the reason that we collect so many spectra of us, we want to find the chemical uh, ripples. 
And the, the reason that we want to find a chemical ripple is because we believe we can use that to understand how the ISM works. For the longest time, because the tools that we use are too are simple, so we miss quite a lot of these simple uh, ripples. But with some sort of the advancement in machine learning, now you can describe higher uh, dimensional space more effectively and will allow you to extract higher order moment. And even just looking at the off or diagonal entry, we can start to see these ripples. What does that mean? Uh, we still do not know yet because to, un to interpret this requires some stochastic uh, chemical uh, evolution models, which one of my students is working on. But it's really something like, you think, oh, this, is, uh, this is the detection of VAO, right? But we, we still do not have the theory, but we, we, we can show that uh, this is real and uh, this is uh, quite exciting. So we'll stop here. Thanks very much. So um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Interesting to see how the higher dimensional modeling is going there. Um, I'm sure that has lots of applications. The Stuart has asked a question saying, uh, surely the recent discovery of the metal pore star by SkyMapper having R process elements enhanced apparently by a magnetorotational hypernova by Yong et al. is all the proof that you need that inferring the abundance of other elements just on the basis of F, E, O, and H is full. Yeah. Yes, so that's the question, right? So if you're looking at the metal poor star, uh, there's no doubt that the elemental abundances are useful. So the debate has been, if you're looking at the solar metallicity star, where, where every star is still crammed into a small uh, region where all stars are basically just uh, solar, uh, should you still uh, measure the, the other uh, abundances? So what we are, are trying to explain here is that even as solar metallicity, where most of the stars are just basically solar plus or minus 0.02 dex, you can still extract very small like, fluctuation at the 0.02 dex level. Cool. I can see no, someone was typing, but they've stopped. Um, so uh, if there's no other questions, then I will go to bed. It's already 1 a.m. here. <laughs> where, where are you at the moment? Uh, Sitting in the U.S. So I am yeah. 1 a.m. now. Yes. So well, thank you very much for staying up for, uh, to 1 a.m. for us. And thank you very much to all the speakers from this session, both for their excellent talks and keeping so well to time. So one more round of applause all around. And now we have um, a break. Um, there's a mental health and wellness section during this break. Um, that I encourage people to go along to and otherwise the next uh, parallels start in half an hour. Um, the pillar start in an hour and the mental health right. session will start in 10 minutes. We're going to give you 10 minutes to get go out and walk around, but it'll start in 10 minutes. Excellent. Thanks go very on. much. Christian.